So let's bring back to where we are at in this course at this time. We've had our borrower, we've qualified our borrower, and that pre-qualification process, and we've given them a pre-qualification form. And then, or to the real estate agent, they go out and shop for a house, and they get make an offer on the house, they get an accepted offer, and then they have a contract, the real estate contract and it will be executed. So executed means it's going to be signed and fully executed means it's signed by all parties. So then once you have the purchase contract, it gives you the property address. So now we have to pause and realize now that you have this property address, you have one of the six key pieces of information that trigger an initial disclosure. So we're gonna cover that here shortly. What are those six key pieces of information? But continuing on here, we have the purchase contract. Typically the real estate agent would then send the contract to the title company. The borrower would give some earnest money putting down on the transaction. And that also would be forwarded on to the title company. And the title company would hold that then in escrow for the transaction. And then at the completion of the transaction, that earnest money would be then credited towards the transaction, whether it be for the down payment or the closing costs. Now, you as a loan officer, you would be given the purchase contract from the real estate agent as well, another copy of it. And either you or your loan processor would reach out to the title company and request title fees. Later, when we discuss the loan estimate itself, having accurate title fees is important in that process. So now let's talk about TRID. TRID is the Truth in Lending, RESPA, which is Real Estate Settlements Procedures Act, Integrated Disclosure Rule. So let me say that again, the TILA RESPA Integrated Disclosure Rule, or otherwise known as TRID. So TRID was developed to create an industry standard for various loan processes and milestones to be met. In other words, there are different agencies, rules, and laws that have different definitions of, and here's the example, of what is the definition of a complete loan application? Being that we had all these different definitions, TRID set an industry standard, which are those six key elements that I just mentioned. Now, once you have these six key elements, you are required to disclose to the borrower. The mechanism to disclose to the borrower through TRID is a loan estimate and the closing disclosure. So the loan estimate is given initially and the CD is given later on in the process near the end of the loan process to accurately disclose to the borrower their closing costs. The main key components of the TRID, the purpose of TRID and the loan estimate and CD portion of it, is to accurately disclose the fees and APR. So what happened is there used to be a truth in lending document, a good faith estimate, and a HUD-1 settlement statement and some other disclosures, such as an ARM disclosure for adjustable rate mortgages, an escrow disclosure, a servicing disclosure, and even an appraisal disclosure. What TRID has done with the mechanism of the loan estimate and the CD was being able to combine these documents into the forms of loan estimate and CD. Now, when we break out the loan estimate further in this chapter and the CD in another chapter later on, we're going to discuss those specific disclosures and those elements contained therein. Right now, we're discussing TRID and the main key components of TRID. So before I continue, let's go back. The definition of a loan application, the 1003 as we call it, that's number one. Number two is once you have this loan application, the six elements that we're going to talk about here momentarily, there's a trigger to disclose accurately via the loan estimate. And then, like I said, later on the CD, and then there's a certain timing. 
So when, once you have that trigger, you have to deliver this initial loan estimate within a specific time frame, And that is three business days after taking a loan application. Three business days after taking a loan application. So after you've given the loan estimate and you followed the timing, then there are tolerances, which mean we know that after you've disclosed to the borrower, certain fees may change. Well, TRID sets tolerance categories, which will be also be discussed later in this chapter. So those are the four main key components that TRID established a definition for the 1003 or a complete loan application. Now, once you have it, the mechanism for disclosing that trigger, okay, once it's been triggered, the loan estimate and the CD, okay, and then ultimately within a certain time, so timing, and then established tolerances in case certain fees did change. Ultimately, the purpose of TRID is to protect consumers from harmful acts, disclosing accurately and making sure things are done timely. So let's dive further into this first component of TRID, where the six key pieces of information that make up a loan application. All right, and this does not require you completing the entire Uniform Residential Loan Application or the URLA, as it's sometimes referred to, or also the 1003. It just requires you collecting six key pieces of information. And then of course, as I had mentioned, once you obtain these six key pieces of information, you're now required to deliver a loan estimate within three business days after receipt of that information. So we have the property address. We also have the estimated value. Remember, we always take the lower of the purchase price or the appraised value. So in the case of a purchase, it would be the purchase price, at least at the beginning or the onset of the loan process. Number three would be the name of the borrower. And then you need the social security number to run the credit report, which then would give you the credit score, which then would enable you to price or give an interest rate to the borrower. If the borrower does not give you their social security number, you are not required to give them a loan estimate. And then the fifth component would be the borrower's income. And the loan amount would be the last item on the list. Once you have those, you must disclose. So let's circle back to that real estate contract we just got. All right, what does that contract give you? The purchase price, that sale price. So we're going to use that as the value. It's also going to give you the property address, information that you did not have before. So now you have an address, you have the value. Now, of course, it's going to give you the borrower's name, but let's just say you already had the borrower, you pre-qualified them. Well, what type of information would you already have on the borrower in that case? Well, yes, you'd have their name, absolutely. Um, you would probably have their credit score, so you would have had their social security number. And if you qualified them, you would probably have their income as well. Now, with receipt of the contract, you now have the remaining information you're able to develop an actual loan amount based on that sale price and finishing that qualification process. Now, once you have those six elements, you will have to disclose. Now, again, we're gonna disclose later in this process, but let's continue on. There's an important reminder. If you have a refinance, a borrower is refinancing, you're already gonna have the property address. Whereas if you're purchasing, the real estate contract is going to give you that address. And another reminder is it does not require you taking a complete loan application, which we're gonna review in just a moment. However, it is very common in your mortgage practice for the borrower to complete this and give you this information, whether they do it online a lot of times, or even if it's over the phone, the borrower has already contacted you, you're gonna sit down and 
take this information. So chances are you'll have for a majority of your loans, yes, a completed application, but just know that it does not require you getting a complete application. It just that most times in your business practice, you're going to have a complete application. So our next step is to let's examine this document called the 1003. The 1003 or the Uniform Residential Loan Application was created by the Federal Housing Finance Agency, the FHFA. And the Fannie Mae number is uh, 1003 and it's listed at the bottom here, as well as Form 65, 1003 for Fannie Mae and 65 for Freddie Mac. For our purposes, we're gonna refer to it as the 1003. Now, as we cover this section, we're gonna highlight those key elements. We may not address every single line, filling out the name or specifically the street address and so on. Uh, we're going to identify the laws as they interact with taking the loan application. And it is your responsibility to become familiar with this 1003 so that you're able to know what items are collected in each section, possibly the pages and the various forms contained within the entirety of the 1003. Now, again, the 1003 was designed for an online version. It is a fully executable PDF. So the borrower can simply fill in the information, click the next button or the tab and go to the next segment space in the PDF. There are two main pieces, the borrower information section, and then there's a lender section, which we're going to talk about later. The two main sections consist of nine pages total. The borrower's pages are seven and the lender's pages are two. Together, they equal a complete 1003. So, Again, for TRID, just to make this clarity, what is a complete application definition is the six elements, okay? And a complete application are the two components, the borrower and the lender in loan information. All right, so let's go through the borrower information. We have in section one, borrower's name and that personal information. Section two would be the assets and liabilities. Section three, the real estate, any real estate they own. Uh, number four would be the loan property information. So the loan they're applying for. Number five would be declarations. Number six would be the acknowledgements and agreements that everything is true and correct. Number seven, military service. Number eight is demographic information. And section nine is for the loan officer information. Now we're gonna break these down and go through these page by page here momentarily, but that is a review of all nine sections of the borrower information portion of the 1003. So let's take a look at page one, section one. So we have section one, that's where the borrower puts their name, social security number, and other personal information. Well, to highlight a couple of key points though, is are they applying for an individual loan credit or are they doing applying for joint credit? Now that'll come into play later on for title purposes and what have you, as we'll show you in the lender portion, but that's initially, so we know what other borrowers are going to be in this loan. And dependents, we have to capture that. Now, capturing that is more for purposes of the, what is the definition of a dependent? We'll see that varies based on your loan program. If FHA, VA, USDA, and conventional loans may have different definitions and therefore capturing that information based on the loan program is what's necessary. And then of course you'll get the cell phone and email address information as well. And if you are doing a joint credit, then an additional borrower will have their own four pages, their section to complete, and we'll review this additional borrower application later in this section. 
for now, let's continue on with some of these key components in section one. So we're going to have to ask the borrower their marital status, which we'll cover here in just a minute, and their birth date. Now, asking that information right off the bat might be a little disturbing. ECOA, so let's bring in the law to how it applies to that specific question. ECOA Regulation B, the Equal Credit Opportunity Act, prohibits discrimination based on race, color, religion, sex, national origin, marital status, age, uh-oh, <laughs> public assistance, and exercising your rights under the Consumer Credit Protection Act. But now you're just going to say, well, we have to ask that information, but we're prohibited. Well, ECOA does allow and requires a loan officer to only ask about marital status if the application is for joint credit. Okay, that makes sense. Or is the credit transaction secured like a mortgage? And if the applicant resides in a community property state. We'll cover that a little later in the in this section, explaining why and how that affects. But at this point, you can only ask married, unmarried, or separated. You are allowed to ask for age. Why? You have to know if the individual is of legal age to enter into a legal contract. So the next law is the Fair Housing Act of 1968. Now, there's some small differences with ECOA, okay? It, it adds disability, but it excludes age. And so how do you determine, well, you've got ECOA and you've got FHA. So look at it this way. ECOA are for the creditor, is for the creditors, okay? So you've got ECOA Equal Credit Opportunity Act, so is only for the creditors loaning the money, that would be you. FHA, well, that still includes you, Fair Housing Act, you're loaning on a house, property, real estate, but it's also for the other parties involved in the transaction, such as the title company, the realtors, the appraisers, inspection companies, even landlords. So again, includes lenders, but all the other players in the transaction, and that's what FHA. Now, let's review those classifications for FHA. We have race, color, religion, sex, disability, familial status, and national origin or ancestry. So any health issues, disease, they would fall under the disability you should know and be aware of which classifications fall into which of these two laws. Now, let's move on with our 1003, section one. We've already covered date of birth, marital status. We're also going to uh, ask, as part of that marital status, if they are unmarried, they do have to complete an unmarried Addendum, which we are going to review a little bit later in this section, but note that we do have another form that each borrower will have to fill out on their own. And then ultimately, we're going to do uh, collect their address. And we always look for a two year history on everything as much as possible. We typically look for two year history. Now, moving on to section 1B, we're going to capture their employment information. So here's two points though that are, I wanna make on this one. It, it allows the borrower to self-identify if they're uh, employed by a family member or a property seller or someone involved within the transaction, okay? And then we allow the borrower to identify if they are self-employed. Now, what constitutes self-employment in the mortgage industry is 25% or more ownership in a company. So 25% or more in the ownership of a company. Very important. And then on to the right of this section 1B, you'll see where uh, you could put the income in there and military entitlements are gathered. So look at that section and understand what those military entitlements are. There's additional information within your textbook for that. 
So just a quick reminder, even employment, just as residences, we look for a two-year history. Now, there may be exceptions for certain loan programs, training, recent graduates, and so on, but it's two-year history on residences, two-year histories on employment, and again, self-employed is greater than or equal to 25%. Now, let's move on to section 1E. Now, this is where we capture other sources of income. Now, because it's an other source of income and it's not maybe a base salary or an hourly wage, and we'll be discussing that in a later chapter as well, but since we're here on the 1003, we're discussing these other types. But if certain sections of the 1003, if you've noticed, there's a does not apply, absolutely, certain sections of the 1003 might not apply to someone. So you'll see that on every section that the borrower has that opportunity to, do, to choose does not apply. But specifically here in 1E, we're going to capture this additional income and different sources that they have of income. But I need to make a very uh, important note or comment about revealing alimony, child support, or separate maintenance. You cannot ask if they are receiving alimony, child support, or separate maintenance, unless they wish to disclose. So you have to ask them, do you have any other sources of income that you would like to include in the qualification process for your loan? But you cannot ask if they receive child support, alimony, or separate maintenance. Now, as a side caveat to that, you must always ask if they are paying because that would be a liability and we would need to include that into debt to income ratio purposes. Let's look at this a little further here and bring up uh, the Equal Credit Opportunity Act again. ECOA actually prohibits asking if the borrower receives child support, alimony, or separate maintenance. So again, a loan officer can only ask if you have any other sources of income that they would like to include. Additionally with ECOA, ECOA prohibits refusing an application to someone on public assistance or refusing to use such income. ECOA also prohibits denying an application based on information such as childbearing or child rearing information. And it's important to note that ECOA prohibits refusing an application to someone receiving part-time income. In other words, you cannot discourage someone from applying for a loan or deny someone or cause harm to anyone based on any prohibited basis. Lender guidelines might end up that the borrower doesn't qualify. And that's understandable. Not everybody does qualify for a loan. But the key component is that you at least have to consider these types of incomes and always, always allow a borrower to apply for a loan. Now in section two, this is where we're gonna capture the assets. Now we're gonna to refer to liquid assets being captured here. And the assets are gonna be used for cash to close, uh, how much money the borrower has to bring in at closing, or reserves, how much money is needed to be left in the bank account after closing for the reserve requirements for the loan. So these are checking accounts, savings accounts, money markets, and so on, and they're gonna be listed in section 2A. So again, we're gonna collect their asset information. Now, if a gift or a grant has already been received and it's been deposited into the bank account, then you would list that here. If it is not, then you would list that over in section 4D, which we'll cover in just a minute. But all gifts, whether deposited or not, are gonna be listed elsewhere on the loan application. So be sure not to list a gift as an asset here. They are listed elsewhere on the 1003. And another key component about assets, most assets need to be sourced, where are they coming from, and seasoned, sitting in a bank account, for at least 60 days, okay? 60 days. Now, there are exceptions to that, gifts, and certain other types, which we'll cover in another chapter. But for now, 
Assets typically need to be sourced and seasoned for 60 days. Now, just as like we had with income, in 2B, we have other types of assets and then even credits. And again, if something doesn't apply, you can always, uh, the borrower can check that section. This is assets, maybe a borrower is selling a house to receive proceeds in order to put down on another house. If they've already sold the house, then they would have already received the money. We'll put that in the bank account up there in 2A. But in 2B is, well, they're waiting for the sale to happen and they're going to be selling one property within just a couple days of or the same day as they're going to be closing on their new home. Well, then we would list it here because they haven't yet received those funds, okay? So this is for other types of assets, okay? But here's a key component. When listing where the assets, even if it's a gift, list the current location of those funds. If it's already in the bank account, it's section 2A. If it hasn't been received yet and it's an other type of asset, it's in 2B. If it is a gift and it hasn't been received yet, then we'll list that in another section in the 1003, which we'll get to here shortly. Now, there's another key component here, unsecured borrowed funds. Well, we're gonna capture whether the borrower has borrowed money at a, from an unsecured source for their down payment. However, we cannot use those funds. So you'd have to instruct your borrower that we, were un, we would be unable to use those. However, if a borrower, let's say, is completing this application, they might not know that. So you would have to inform them. But just remember, we do not use and cannot use unsecured borrowed funds in a mortgage transaction. Now, one last piece in 2B are the credits. So remember the earnest money that we had talked about? This is where you would list that. Now, if for some reason at the time of the application, the earnest money had not yet been given and it was still in the bank account, then we would list it in section 2A. But if it's already been given, we would account for that then here in 2B. We wanna be sure we're not duplicating our assets, listing them one place and then listing them in a second place. And then that makes for inaccuracies when actually qualifying the borrower. Now let's go to section 2C. This is the liability section. Now, what we do is we'll run a credit report and we'll have our loan application and we'll be working in a loan origination software, our LOS. And what happens is the credit report is run, pulled into the, the data is pulled into our LOS and it's auto-populated. So at least you don't have to type out all of the liabilities for those that have pages of maybe student loans, car payments, credit cards, and a lot of debts. That would be a lot of data entry. So at least that portion of it will be auto-populated for you. Now, sometimes a borrower might actually have a debt or liability that doesn't show on their credit report. Or as I mentioned before, the borrower might have to pay alimony, child support, or separate maintenance. This is where we capture that information in 2D, okay? So this is sections 2C, they're auto-populated, that's on the credit report, and section 2D are the items that might not be listed then on the credit report because we need to capture all the liabilities in order to qualify the borrower accurately and come up with an accurate debt-to-income ratio. Now, when discussing liabilities, important to remember, we do not include general household expenses, cell phone bills, utilities, personal insurances, or voluntary payroll deductions. Now, we are gonna discuss this later in another chapter, but just understand those personal household expenses are not included in our debt to income ratio. Now, I do wanna make a note on VA loans. We do use certain household expenses for residual income tests, but not for debt to income ratio. But again, that's specific to VA loans or any time a lender would be doing a residual income test. Now let's move on to section three. This is where we're gonna capture the real estate owned. If the borrower owns any real estate, if of course, if they don't, they select the box at the top that says, I don't own any other real estate. 
Now, if it is a refinance transaction, they do need to list that property first. And that property would be called the subject property. Now, below that then would be any other property that they would own. And it's important to understand that even if there's no loan, no lien on the property, we still need to have the borrower list every single property they own because we need to capture the property tax, the homeowner's insurance. And if there's a homeowner's association, a borrower may be receiving rental income. And again, we're going to discuss that in a later chapter. Right now we're taking the 1003, but it's very important to understand you have to capture all properties owned, whether there's a loan on it or not, in order to have an accurate debt to income ratio later on when we calculate that. Now, section four. Section four is for the loan information. The, the borrower gets to identify, are they applying for a purchase or a refinance? And they can put the address there. And how many units is the property going to be? And I'll address that in just a minute. And if what type of occupancy, is it owner occupied or is it a investment property or non-owner occupied property? And, or is it a manufactured home? All of these are very important components that affect underwriting, loan to value, even the loan program you are qualifying for, the interest rate, maybe even the months of reserves that are required for the loan, and even the credit score requirements. So important to note though, under RESPA, the Real Estate Settlements Procedures Act of 1974, Regulation X, again, RESPA defines a residential property as a one to four family single family dwelling. What does that mean is up to four units, but each unit is for a single family. Anything more than four units would be a commercial loan. Now in section 4B, we're going to capture if there's any other loans being taken out simultaneously with this mortgage to have part of the down payment. So we talked about earlier loan to value and CLTV and HCLTV. If there's a HELOC involved, this is where we would capture that information for subordinate financing. And now we talked about gifts and grants, whether deposited or not deposited, go in 4D, but you would identify if it has or has not. Moving on to section five, section five is the declarations. Now, if the borrower for some reason doesn't fill this section out and you end up going back to the borrower to fill this out, please, please do not assume. You need to have accuracy. Is this going to be the primary home of the borrower? And do they have a relationship with somebody involved in the transaction? Are they borrowing money for this transaction? And is there... Do they have debts that aren't listed on the credit report? Very important. And if the borrower fails to disclose accurately, that's fraud. Additionally, in section five, specifically 5B, the declarations are continued to ask additional questions. Please don't assume if the borrower does not fill this out, it is fraud if it is not filled out truthfully. So loan officers, you should be aware of all of the questions in section five. Now let's move on to section six. This is where they acknowledge and they sign acknowledging everything they've provided is true and correct. And again, if they are committing fraud, mortgage fraud is a $1 million fine and or 30 years in prison. As we move on to section seven, we'll capture any military service and that'll be helpful for your VA loans if you are doing those. And section eight then is the demographic information. Now let's take a look at this a little further, this demographic information in section eight. ECOA, once again, prohibits collection of information about race, color, religion, national origin, or sex, except when necessary to comply with HMDA or the Home Mortgage Disclosure Act, Regulation C. So let's talk about that a little bit, is HMDA requires the reporting of data annually and then is used to identify discriminatory lending practices. Now this information is voluntary. So a borrower has the option of providing this information or not, but 
If you're taking a face-to-face -face loan application, it is required for you as a loan originator to guess, to make a best guess. So let's take a look at this. Uh, specifically, if you notice, and I'll read this to you, was the ethnicity of the borrower collected on the basis of, and here's the key words, visual observation or surname? And you select yes or no. Very important. And this is only for face-to-face -face now. Only for face-to-face. -face. Video conferencing is also considered face-to-face. -face. Anything other than face-to-face is optional and you're not required to guess on that. There is a section where it the borrower can select, I do not wish to provide. Since we're speaking of HMDA, the Home Mortgage Disclosure Act that was enacted in 1975, HMDA for short, Regulation C. Let's take a look at some of these key components of HMDA. Well, the data is collected to see whether or not the lenders are serving the housing needs of their areas and identify those potential discriminatory lending practices. The data is used to determine if they're violating ECOA or FHA. Now, the CFPB dictates the guidance that lenders follow on how to report this information, what institutions are covered, now, there's more information in your textbook, so please look at that, take the time to read that so you have a better understanding. We're going to cover some key highlights, though, here, like the types of institutions that are required to report, the types of transactions that must be reported, what information is collected, and uh, how is it reported. And here's just a few key points, like loan volume thresholds. So the volume of at least 25 closed-end mortgage loans or at least 500 open-end lines of credit, both in the preceding two calendar years. And then, of course, meeting all the other coverage requirements. Again, there's more information in your textbook. Please read up on that so you're familiar with these aspects of HMDA. Now, as far as those data points that are collected by HMDA, there are 49 data points. Let's take a look at some of these from loan program to loan type, purpose, occupancy, the property type, number of units. We just discussed that. All of this is being collected from your 1003, loan to value, CLTV, any lien status like subordinate financing, your rate, the pricing on the loan, the rate spread, how much your company's making, any points or fees, a lender origination fees, total costs on a loan. And then if a consumer comes into your office and asks for your hum to report, you have to give it to them within three business days. So there's more information again in your textbook. I would go ahead and make sure you read that and understand those key components of HMDA. But I want to end this HMDA section with three key elements. So the main primary purposes of HMDA are to determine whether that financial institution is serving the community's needs, those community housing needs. And number two is to help and assist public officials in distributing public investment. And number three, and the one we've been talking about, is to identify potential discriminatory lending patterns. Now, as we continue coming back to the 1003, so that was section eight of your 1003 was the demographic addendum required to collect that information based on HMDA. Now we move on to section nine, which is the originator information. It's where you would sign put your NMLS number, and so on. So remember, your NMLS number is being captured on all loan documents. Now, we talked about additional borrowers at the very beginning of the loan application, page one, section one. It's going to ask for, if you're applying for a joint credit or are you doing this as an individual. I mentioned as an additional borrower, there'd be four additional pages. Let's take a look at that section for additional borrowers here in for just a moment. So as I mentioned, there's a four-page addendum just for additional borrowers. 
Now in section one, it's the same information being captured as the borrower completed on their application. So we don't need to re-review that. But important to note for assets and liabilities in section two and section three, the real estate and section four for any loan and property information, that it actually contains a statement. And as you can see on your screen, my information for now sections two, three, and four is listed on the uniform residential loan application and then with the borrower's name. So as you can see, those are a little different. But then when we go back to section five, the declarations, it's asking the same questions as we did before, but now for each individual borrower. And then section six also has that same statement for that acknowledgement is my signature for section six is on the uniform residential loan application with, and then naming the borrower. Section seven for military service, again, same questions. Section eight, the demographic information, same questions. Section nine, loan officer, same questions. Okay, so that is the four page addendum for the additional borrower. Now let's move on to the lender and loan information. So that is two additional pages for a total of nine. Now it's important to note that both pieces, the borrower section and the lender and loan section make up a complete 1003, okay? The complete loan application. So let's take a look at this in a little more detail. We have section one with the property and loan information, section two for the title information, section three, the mortgage loan information, and section four for the qualifying the borrower. So here we have L1. Now the L stands for lender, so you can identify which forms that you're on. But L1, you're gonna list, is it a community property state? Remember, we talked about community property state information at the beginning. You're going to need to capture that because community property states affect the borrower's liabilities, the debt to income ratio, and even the property ownership requirements. We also capture if it is a refinance, whether it's cash out or no cash out refinance and so on. As we move on to L2, this is where we're going to capture title information. So, Who's gonna be on the title? Who's gonna own the property? Now, it's important to note that somebody could own the property and not necessarily be on the loan. So you're gonna to need to ask and capture that information. And we're also gonna determine how, which you may not know this information yet, and we're gonna discuss that in a later chapter, but we will eventually be capturing how title will be taken. And it's important to understand, is the property fee simple or lease hold? Now, just a quick note on that. So fee simple is when you own the house or the property and you own the land. Whereas a leasehold, as in certain states, like maybe Hawaii, and maybe there's a 99 year lease, or maybe you're in a uh, resort area and the home is on a golf course. You might own the home, but you don't own the land. So you have a lease, it's called leasehold property. Eventually the lease is going to expire. So there'll be an expiration date that you'll capture. But here's the component for financing. So if you have a 99 year lease, you're fine because we only do 30 year mortgages at most. But what if you only have 20 years left on your lease? You would not be able to do a 30 year loan. In other words, it's going to be equal to or less than, that's the, the amortization term, has to be equal to or less than the remaining time of the lease. Now in section L3, we're going to capture that loan information where we have, is it a conventional, is it USDA, is it FHA, VA, and so on. Also, the terms of the loan, meaning what's the note rate, as well as the actual term. Now it's important to note that we do in months, everything is in months, so 30 year would be 360. 360 months, and where it would be uh, 180 months for a 15 year and so on. We use months and you need to capture that correctly. Some additional information, amortization type and any loan features, just take a look at that and get familiar with your loan application. Then in section L4, we're gonna capture the financial details. So we got the sale price, we're gonna list any closing costs and any, uh, um, 
loans that would be being paid off it was if it was a refinance and what are those closing costs so this is section l4 now section l4 kind of breaks down into four different sections so this is first what's due from the borrowers so we add all this up and we got to come up with this amount of money which also includes the payoff if it's a refinance or if it's a the sale price we still have to come up with that money now then when we go to the next section we're going to come up with that money via the loan amount. So we're going to list that and any other secondary mortgages or secondary financing that's going to come into play. And then the third element of that is going to be any credits. Maybe the seller is going to offer a, a credit paying the borrower's closing costs. That happens quite often. And any earnest money, we talked about that at the very beginning. This is where we would actually have that listed as well. And then Continuing on to the very last section, that fourth section, is when we take all those numbers and we come together, adding them and subtracting them, and we're going to come up with the cash to close. How much money does the borrower need to bring in at closing? Or in the case of a refinance, uh, how much money might the borrower be getting back? Now, as we wrap up the 1003 sections, we're going to have some additional forms and addendums that may be used, may be required for the loan. So to start with, a continuation sheet. Well, we realize maybe the borrower has more liabilities on their credit report than there are enough line spaces on the application. Or maybe they have a lot of assets or maybe they own a lot of real estate and there's not enough space on the initial application for that. So we would have a continuation sheet. And there's a continuation sheet for every single section. And then there's the additional borrower section, which we just reviewed, those four pages. And the third addendum that would be required or needed would be the unmarried addendum. Now, if you remember at the beginning on page one of the 1003, we captured the information. Do you remember the questions we can ask and only ask? It's married, unmarried, or separated. So if they're unmarried, then we have to have them fill out this document here. So whether or not they're in a civil union, a domestic partnership, a registered reciprocal beneficiary relationship. So folks, have your borrowers fill this out if they are unmarried. So now let's review the 1003. We talked about the seven pages for the borrower with nine sections. And then the four page addendum if you have an additional borrower. And then that one page additional unmarried addendum, one for each borrower. And then two pages for the lender information. And then, of course, if there's any additional continuation pages and the instructions are 13 pages in themselves, but they may not always be applicable on your transaction. But for the most part, we're looking at anywhere from a 15 to a 20 page loan application. Now, let me give you some tips on taking that 1003. You really need to know your 1003. You may uh, not be in the office. You may be on the phone, not having a document in front of you. In, again, not in your office and at a, another function and you're having a conversation with somebody. The key components, the information that's needed in order to qualify a borrower is located in the 1003. So knowing the questions, understanding the 1003, it's key in being a successful loan officer and having a complete application. That's probably the biggest item to remember is a complete loan application before you move the loan file further in the journey. So the tip I want to give you is take your own loan application, know the sections, know what information is captured, fill it out as if you're your own loan officer, at least for practicing purposes. You really need to become familiar with this loan application since you'll be doing this every day the rest of your life. Now, as we've been mentioning, when you take the loan application, ECOA, the Equal Credit Opportunity Act, Regulation B, 1974, is designed to prevent discrimination based on a protected class. Well, since we're taking the loan application, we've also discussed ECOA. There are some additional disclosures within ECOA that need to be addressed. So a notice of adverse action or notice of action, as well as an appraisal notice are all part of ECOA as well. Let's discuss this adverse action. What does that mean? You've taken this loan application, right? And the borrower doesn't qualify. 
you have to tell the borrower whether favorably or adverse that they don't qualify or they do qualify. So within 30 days. So in a nutshell, an easy way to think of it is you have 30 days to decision this file. You get that loan application, you hit the stopwatch and it's 30 days to decision a loan file. Now, if it's favorable, you're gonna give what's called a notice of action. Here's your loan, here's your terms, here's what you qualify for. But if it's denied, you're gonna provide an adverse action. Now, it's important to note on an adverse action. With ECOA, adverse action is for all reasons of denial, including credit. The reason I make this distinction is later on in the course, there is another adverse action, but it's designed specifically for credit only. ECOA adverse action is for all reasons of denial, including credit. Very important distinction. And there are two exceptions though to this 30 day timing. Let's say you give a counter offer and meaning the borrower applies for the loan and you're still within the 30 days, but they don't qualify, but then you give them a counter offer for a different program. Now you have 90 days before you have to send the adverse action. Because obviously they didn't qualify for the first program, but rather than denying the loan then, you gave a counter offer. And then if the loan application was incomplete, you just give them a notice of incomplete, letting the borrower know, hey, I'm still needing this additional pay stub, some tax returns and whatever other items are needed. That extends the notice of action deadline 30 days. Now, as part of the adverse action, you're gonna give the creditor's name, the creditor's address, and it's important to note the nature of the action taken, the specific reasons why you denied the loan. What were those reasons? And that the borrower has the right, in this will be in the notice, to request those reasons they were denied within 60 days of receiving the adverse action. Now, the other notice, is appraisal. And I'm gonna come back to a key component here in just a minute, but I wanna do the disclosures first, okay? And then explain why they're a part of ECOA. So talking about the appraisal notice, the borrower has the right to receive a copy of the appraisal. Now, if you remember when we talked about TRID in the beginning here, the first reason, purpose of TRID was to identify what is a complete application, that definition. And if you remember then, the second component was the mechanism once you've triggered that complete application is to disclose the accurate fees and APR. The mechanism is the loan estimate initially and the CD prior to closing. Well, we're going to discuss the CD in a later chapter as well as the loan estimate in the next section. But that initial disclosure to the borrower of their right to receive a copy of the appraisal within three business days prior to consummation is the word, the closing, but it's the consummation date, okay? Which we'll also discuss later when we talk about this, the loan estimate here, but focusing on three business days, delivering that appraisal, why is this a part of ECOA? Why was the notice of action a part of ECOA? Well, let's look at it this way. If I give a copy of the appraisal to this borrower, but then I choose not to give a copy of the appraisal to that borrower, maybe I deny that borrower, give them a notice of that information, and then this borrower over here, I don't even call that borrower back. Am I treating the borrowers equally? Well, of course not. <laughs> of course you're not. Well, that's what ECOA is about, treating everyone equally. You give a copy of the appraisal to this person, you give a copy of the appraisal to that person. You deny this person, you tell them, you deny that person, you tell them, and so on. And you approve somebody, you inform them. So you're treating everyone equal. Regulation B, and possibly an easy way to remember that was because you're being equal. You want to be equal. But now let me finish with this ECOA, right to receive a copy of the appraisal. So the lender may not charge the borrower for delivering the appraisal. You're going to print it off and you're going to give it to the borrower. You're going to email it. You can't charge for that. 
And if you're going to do an appraisal waiver, maybe the loan doesn't require an appraisal. You're getting a property inspection waiver. Well, then you have to inform the borrower that they're not going to be getting a copy of the appraisal because there is no appraisal. And maybe the loan doesn't close. Well, you still need to provide a copy of the appraisal no later than 30 days after determining that the transaction is not going to close. And the mechanism for doing this, again, is initially in the loan estimate and then at closing or three days before closing, which again, we'll cover later with the CD, is the loan estimate in the CD disclose these rights or the borrower's rights to receive a copy of the appraisal three business days before consummation. Well, folks, that wraps up the 1003 portion of the TRID that we've been talking about. And now to go into the loan estimate and delivering that loan estimate within three business days, so timely, and then eventually tolerances of when fees can change.